please introduce Stuart Hameroff, professor at the University of Arizona, active in the Center for Consciousness Studies. So Stuart, you are on the cutting edge of uh, quantum physics and consciousness, and the intersection of those two. Yes, Greg, I think uh, quantum physics is the key to consciousness. You know, going back to the Greeks, there's been this controversy between whether the brain produces consciousness or some part of consciousness is out in the universe that we access. And quantum physics allows us to sort of bridge that gap and actually favors uh, being able to access parts of consciousness or the isn't in the universe, but working through the brain. Are you saying that um, we are accessing something that, that pre-exists and we're basically just a conduit for it then, or do we have a say? Well, it's not quite that simple. Um, there are basically two approaches to the so-called hard problem of consciousness, namely uh, the hard problem being why we have experience, why we have flavors, tastes, emotions, feelings, how we're different from robots or zombies, mm -hmm. uh, why we have an inner life. And the two approaches are basically emergence and some kind of fundamental approach. Emergence is the idea that conscious experience emerges at sort of a high level of complexity. The brain, like many other systems, being sort of a hierarchy, and if you get complex enough up that hierarchy, voila, some new property emerges, like, uh, like a, a, a storm, for example, a hurricane or a tornado is a pattern that emerges from simple elements, mm -hmm. gas molecules, air molecules, uh, working together to, to make a funnel cloud, for example, or the great red spot of Jupiter, or a candle flame is an emergent property, or the property of wetness from water is an emergent property. So many people think that consciousness emerges as a new novel property at a high level of complexity in this hierarchical system that we call the brain. The problem with that, I think, is that none of these other emergent phenomena are conscious. They don't have conscious experience. Moreover, there's no real prediction at what level of complexity consciousness might occur in the brain. And if that were the case, computers should be conscious already or should soon be. So for that reason, plus the fact that that would uh, take away any possibility of free will, it also wouldn't be of binding, how we bind everything together into one sense of self or unity of consciousness, and how we transition from the pre-conscious or subconscious to consciousness itself. These problems, I think, suggest that there's something more to consciousness than being an emergent property of computation. The brain is more than a simple classical computer. Uh, when you say that, that computers would be conscious by now or soon, does that mean that they're doing as many computations as our brain is doing right now? Well, or, or will be soon? Well, they will be within the next 20 years or so. And people make these predictions that when the brain reaches a certain level of computations, equivalent to the brain, it should be conscious. But of course, then they'll hedge and say, well, no, it's not organized the same. They'll keep pushing the boundary back. But the first problem with that is that, that uh, AI people, artificial intelligence people who make these predictions, assume that the brain works uh, along the lines of a computer in that the neurons of the brain and their connections, the synapses, are the fundamental units. So, for example, we have roughly uh, 10 billion neurons mm -hmm. with, the, which, with a thousand connections each or 10,000 switches to other neurons, which gives us about 10 to the 15th operations per second okay. uh, with each neuron operating as a fundamental unit. The problem with that is that each neuron is much, much more complex than a simple switch. For example, consider a simple, a single cell like a, a paramecium, a single cell organism. Mm -hmm. It swims around, it finds food, it learns. If you suck it into a capillary tube, it escapes. And if you do it again, it gets out quicker and quicker each time so it can learn. It can find mates. It has a sex life. It does all kinds of things. It doesn't have any synapses whatsoever. It's just one cell. And yet it's conscious. I'm not sure it's conscious or not. That's a little bit. Okay. But it's certainly intelligent, and it does complex things without any synapses. All right. So if a paramecium, one cell, can do all those things, why should we think that a neuron is just a simple on-off switch or that a synapse is just a simple on-off switch? The capacity of a neuron is much greater than that. If we go back to the paramecium, how does, how does it do that? It uses its internal structure, its cytoskeleton, the, what, what seems like the structural support, but, it, but which is also the, the nervous system within each cell, the, the cytoskeleton comprised of microtubules mainly, which are these hollow cylindrical polymers that, that are seem, seemingly perfectly designed to be information processing devices at the molecular level, a scale below that of neurons. They are the nervous system, ner the nervous system within each neuron, if you will. So 
these proteins, they're made of proteins, switch much faster than neurons. There's many, many more of them. Um, well, there's like um, 10 million within each cell, for example, switching in the nanosecond. So if we think of processing going down to that level, there's, enough pro there's as much processing in one neuron at that level as there is in the whole brain, according to these AI-type estimates. So if we think that, that information processing in the brain goes down to the level of the microtubules, for example, we've increased the information capacity uh, by from somewhere from 10 to the 15th, roughly to 10 to the 27th. All right, we're doubling. Almost well, we're squaring it, yeah. Exactly, okay. So <clears throat> that pushes the, the goal way farther for the AI people. The problem is that even if that were the case, even if we're doing 10 to the 27th operations per second, even if the microtubules are the fundamental uh, computers of consciousness, that still doesn't tell us why we have experience, why we have an inner life, why we have emotions, feeling, what philosophers call qualia. Mm -hmm. That's just more reductionism, more, um, you know, more computation, but doesn't solve the problem, nor does it solve the other problems like binding, transition from pre-conscious processing to consciousness, the problem of free will, and so forth. And actually, I worked on uh, the idea that microtubules inside neurons and other cells were information processors and, uh, for, for almost 20 years, suggesting that to understand consciousness, to understand the brain, we needed to go inside each neuron to this level to consider all this information processing. And yet, people would say, okay, maybe you're right, so what? How does that solve the, the hard problem, as it's now known, of consciousness? How do you explain conscious experience from just further reductionism? And I had to admit that they were right. Um, even if the capacity of the brain were, were squared, it still didn't tell us why we had consciousness. Because the same arguments against emergence that I mentioned before still held. So at that point, about 1990, I read a book by Roger Penrose, the uh, Oxford mathematical physicist, called The Emperor's New Mind. And The Emperor's New Mind was kind of a challenge to artificial intelligence, AI being kind of uh, the computer uh, industrial complex pushing the idea that larger and larger computers will, will attain consciousness. And Roger's book was based on the idea that, uh, that our minds, our conscious minds, do, do something that is beyond the realm of regular computation. He called it non-computable. And basically it was the idea that we do things that we know things other than through algorithms, other than through things that a computer can do. And he argued, it's through Gödel's theorem, and it's uh, mathematical and philosophical. And to be honest, I didn't really understand all those arguments. Um, but my gut level was that he was right. He argued that to explain consciousness, to explain how we can have this non-computability, which is really another word for free will, or along the lines of free will, or going in the direction of free will. Because if the brain is just a computer, everything is deterministic. We're just reaction, reacting to things in our environment. Which and means we should be completely predictable. Completely in the same predictable. Way a computer is correct. Or you know, with, maybe with some randomness, but right. but, uh, but you not know, the amount of randomness that we well, not we certainly have. no free will, and uh, we would be uh, as as the philo as the philosopher uh, Huxley said, merely helpless spectators. Mm -hmm. We would be epiphenomena, just along for the ride. We wouldn't be in control of anything. Mm -hmm. We would just be well, epiphenomena, just you know, going along with our our actions and you know, observing basically without really having a say in what was going on. We might think we did, but, but it was an illusion. So Roger's idea was that the only thing in nature that can give us this non-computable element was a quantum mechanism, specifically a quantum gravity mechanism. And this seems so tangential to the idea of what's going on in the brain that most people really couldn't buy it. And um, it, it, it's, a, it's a difficult concept, but to me, intuitively, there was something, something to it because what he said was, well, he likened the brain to a quantum computer. And that brings us into the world of, of quantum theory, which is a very difficult subject. In fact, Richard Feynman once said that anyone who claims to understand quantum theory is either lying or crazy because it's so bizarre. For example, if you go down to the quantum realm, like small, like down, say, to the level of atoms, and it, it may be larger, but let's just talk about atoms, subatomic <coughs> particles, things are completely different than they are in our, our classical world where, where things are firm and real and in one place because... At the quantum level, things can be in multiple places at the same time. 